as I know here, you're in trouble. Where it says about 30% are unemployed. That's why I'm working hard to get this surplus food here. Some of you say to me, well, I'm not like you. I'm not a congressman. Uh, I haven't got education. Uh, I haven't got work. Uh, uh, but you're a human being. And you know what you've got? As I know here, you're you've got in, in your hands a Where it says about 30% are unemployed. To use your vote. That's why I'm working hard to get this and surplus use food here. And even those few cents Some you, you say get them to me. To spend them only where you want to spend them. A young slave boy stood one day before the greatest ruler of his day. And God said to Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses said, Lord, only I've got a stick, that's all. He said, well, let me use what's in your hand. And God used... That slave boy with a stick in his hand to divide the Red Seas, march through a wilderness, bring water out of rocks, manna from heaven, and bring his people to freedom land. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? George Washington Carver, who was so frail that he was traded for a broken down horse as a slave boy. And George Washington Carver, sitting in the science laboratory at Tuskegee, told me, he said, Dr. Powell, he said, I just go out on the fields each morning at 5 o'clock, and I let God, God guide me. And I bring back these little things and work them over my laboratory. And that man did more to revolutionize the agricultural science of peanuts and of cotton and sweet potato than any other human being in the field of agricultural science. What's in your hand? Just let God use you, that's all. What's in your hand? I've got a string in my hand, that's all, and I'm flying a kite. And way up in the heavens, lightning strikes it. And I, Benjamin Franklin, discover for the first time the possibilities of electricity with a string in my hand. What's in your hand? Little hunchback sitting in a Roman jail. I haven't got anything in my hand but an old quill pen, but... God says, write what I tell you to write. Paul wrote, I have run my race with patience. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth has laid up the union. What's in your hand, little boy? All I've got is a slingshot. And the enemies of my people are great and big and more numerous than we are. Well, little David, go down to the brook and pick out a few stones and come on back and close your eyes if you want to and pull back that slingshot and let him go. And David killed the biggest enemy, the leader of the giants against his people and his people became free, just letting God guide a stone in his hand. And a few years passed and David is a king and God says, what's in your hand? He said, I've got a harp in my hand. He said, well, David, play on your harp. And he prayed, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Take me to lie down in green pastures. Lead it me besides the waters. Yea, though I walk to the valley in the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? Man hanging on a cross. I've got two nails in my hand. Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdrawest thyself from me, whither shall I go? And that man, with two nails in his hand, split history in half, B.C. and A.D. And what's in your hand tonight, people of Cambridge? You've got God in your hand, and he'll let you win, because he's on your side, and one with God, always in the majority. So walk with him, and talk with him, and work with him, and stick together, and fight together, and with God's hand in your hand, the victory will be accomplished here sooner than you dreamed, sooner than you hoped, sooner than you prayed for, sooner than you imagined. Good night and God bless you. Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rick Young. This is another segment of What's in Your Hand. And that was Reverend Dr. Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who was the pastor at Abyssinian Church, and he was also a congressman. So he was doing politics and he was doing religion. He was passionate at the church.
And my guest today is, ironically, a surgeon, and he's running for the New York City, the mayor of New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, Raja Flores. Hey, Raja, how are you doing today? Good, Rick. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, wonderful. So Reverend Dr. Adam Clayton Powell was a congressman, and he was a pastor. He was the pastor of Abyssinian Church. So he's kind of doing what you're doing. Or yeah. you're doing what he did. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I yeah. agree. Yeah. And we met at, uh, you know, before you became a surgeon, we met at Gleason's Gym. I don't know if you remember these things. <laughs> you remember those things? I still got a little bit there. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, wow. Uh, so, you know, running for mayor of New York City, one of the toughest cities in the world, one of the most world famous cities in the world. Why New York City mayor? So I think that's a good question. See, I mean, the whole world looks at New York as this big uh, entity. I look at New York as a small town. This is where I grew up. This is where I have my roots, my family. This is where I learned about life. And this is the city that gave me the breaks that I needed to do something with my life. So for me, this is just my, my hometown. It's a small town, even though it's a big city. So I look at it from that perspective. Mm, okay. So what's some of the issues that made you say, you know what, I need to run for mayor? It's actually one thing that actually made me run for mayor. So I've been a surgeon for 30 years. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've been operating in East Harlem for the past 10 years. And what I see now that I didn't see before is that I found myself operating on patients who had fungus coming out of their lungs from mold that they were exposed to in their homes. So the difference where I'm operating now is there is a lot of NYCHA in the area of East Harlem or Spanish Harlem, you wanna call it El Barrio. Um, basically, there's a lot of NYCHA there. So you have uh, a lot of my patients uh, were from uh, Carver Houses, Wagner, uh, from Taft, you know, the whole area there. And so what I started seeing was uh, I've had to remove half of people's lungs for this mold that they develop. And that, that's a big deal. And so what I started to figure out is where's this mold coming from? So I visited uh, a bunch of my patients' homes. So I actually had gone to their homes to see how they were living. And what I've noticed was that a lot of the mold was in the bathrooms where there's a constant leak or constant moisture. And when you look in the hallways and in, in their apartments, you see walls that are crumbling that could be contaminated with asbestos and with lead. So not only do you see how they're sick, but you see how things like lead and other kinds of uh, contaminants can hurt their children as well. And I realized, wow, this is a big societal problem. This is bad policy that's making these patients sick. So what was in my hand was a scalpel. And what I realized is I need a pen in my hand to make a difference in their lives. Wow, that's pretty... Uh... That, that's a tough situation. Uh, and how long have you been seeing this like this? So this has happened now for the past 10 years. For the uh, 10 years before this, I was working in Sloan Kettering, which is on 68th Street and, and York Avenue. And I was seeing a different uh, type of patient, a lot more cancer, a lot more elective cases. But then when I started working in East Harlem, I started seeing more of these cases that uh, that develop because of where they're living. And, and it's really something that uh, I take to heart because when I was a kid, you know, our apartment wasn't the best and the walls were falling down and we were exposed to stuff. And, uh, but that was all that we had. And what I realized here, you have similar situation with the people living the way they're living and, and they're paying rent. It's not like they're be given a handout, they're paying rent. And if you pay rent, there's an understanding. Listen, I pay the rent and you make sure I'm living in a safe home, but that's not what's happening. They're being completely neglected. The politicians who are making these policies would never live the way they're living, yet they expect 
the people living in NYCHA to live that way. And, and I think it's very unfair. And I realize that no one's listening and maybe they are listening, but I get the sense that no one cares. So I, I just felt like mm. I need a big wow. platform to be able to bring this and make this the priority. This to me is the number one priority of New York City. You've got half a million people living in NYCHA and they need our help. And that is the main reason why I'm running. Wow. You know, when I was growing up, I would say politics, you know, I stay away from it. I'm not interested in politics or anything. But now we're starting to see how important it is. And as I told you earlier, how are you going to win the game when you don't know the rules? So how can people educate themselves about what's going on? And I think that's and how they can make a difference, how they can change. It. And I think that's very important because uh, a lot of people don't know the rules. The people who are uh, living in NYCHA in those conditions, many times they're hopeless and they don't realize there is a lot that they can do to help their own situations. And there's a saying that my mom always told me growing up, God helps those who help themselves. So, but they've got to know what they can do. And they got to understand that their situation has been imposed on them. This is not because they don't care for their family. This is not because they don't want to make their situation better. They're forced to live in these situations uh, that are a result of just neglect. And that's why I feel it's important to get that message out. And not only, you know, I'm running not to be a politician. I'm running because there's a group of people that need a voice and I'm trying to be that voice to show this is what's happening and this is what we need to do to fix it. Mm -hmm. So you said God helps those who help themselves, right? Yep. And sometimes that might consist of some flashcards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep, you're right. Well, you know what? I got some flashcards here. Uh oh. Here. I'm just going to read. It says, uh, your world will change whether or not you choose to change it. But you do have the power to choose its direction. W. Clement Stone. This is a, this is a Napoleon Hill uh, flashcard deck. And you, know, you talk about flashcards. Hey, I got some <laughs> cards. It's pretty powerful. So what did your mom teach you about flashcards? So, you know, like any mom, she wanted to try and get her kid an education. Right. And, you know, schools are not always uh, the first line of teaching. It's usually the parents. So, wow. yeah, so, so my mom um, tried to get me to learn stuff. And the way she did it was she said, listen, learn the times table. And, you know, you had the flashcards with one through nine. And she said, you learn the times table and I'll give you five dollars. So that was enough of a motivation to make me learn it. And once I learned it, I got the $5. But then I realized when I went to school, uh, I had uh, uh, an edge because I already knew this stuff. And I always have a saying, kids that start ahead, stay ahead. And so the fact that I had that background already that I learned at home, when I got to school, um, it really helped and benefited me to get confidence uh, with academic work, which I think is important, especially today. We got to make sure our kids are well prepared so they're confident so that school is enjoyable. Because if they don't do good in school, they don't, they're not going to want to do it. You want to do stuff that you're good at. And so we have to give them the tools so that when they hit school, uh, they can excel. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, that $5, did it go a long ways back then, back in those days? Well, back then, I remember for a dollar, we could get three Cokes, three bags of potato chips, and a pack of Razzles. And that, that was when the subway was 35 cents. Okay. <laughs> wow. Wow. 35 cents to ride the subway. It's like it $2 was, and change now. No, no, no. Not two seventy five. And that, And then you had that round thing with the little Y in the middle that was... Uh, the token. Yep, that little token with the Y in the middle. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
If you showed that to someone today, they might know what is that? <laughs> they don't even know what a token is. Yeah. How do we build bridges from, you know, our experience to the young experience today? How do we build bridges so that we can work together? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult thing. Bridges take time to build. They take an investment. And so it's not something that happens quickly. So you have to make sure it's a priority. And I think if we want a better world, we got to focus on our kids. You know, nowadays we have a lot of kids that are lost in this city. Just like the other day, you know, 13 year old kid got, got shot in the Bronx. And mm -hmm. I think we have to make sure that we let these kids know that you're tuned in ghtr.nyc grant houses community radio home of the community news service and the soul the soul, the soul. of the upper west side uh my apologies roger that was uh, tina dixon doing the station id my apologies okay continue so basically how do we number one prevent kids like that from getting hurt? And number two, how do we give them the tools so that they can thrive in life, so they can have a, a, a job that gives them confidence, that gives them self-esteem? And the main thing, I think, especially the kids nowadays, especially the young, the young boys need role models, and they need people who can let them know this is what it takes to be a man. My dad left when I was six years old, so I was raised by my mom. And I was always looking for, for male role models. And, you know, I think these kids are searching for how to be a man. And you know what? Being a man doesn't mean you can take your trigger finger, one little finger like this, and kill somebody. That doesn't make you a man. And I think they have to see men that they look up to who, uh, who have lived good, productive lives taking care of their community. And, you know, and I think, you know, you have to realize kids have to be, at least when they grow up the way we did, that, you know, there's uh, a way that you have to be to make sure you don't get picked on, to make sure you're not a target. And it's a way of, I don't know how to say it, you got to try and be bad, but you don't really want to be bad. And, I think boxing is a good way to help kids. You know, before I started boxing, I was getting into a lot of fights. And then when I started boxing, I stopped fighting outside of the ring. And <laughs> it was because you felt like, okay, I, I, I'm doing what a man does. And it wasn't just because of fighting. It was self-discipline. It was self-reliance. It were things that help you throughout your life. And I think that's what's lacking nowadays with kids because everyone's behind closed doors with, you know, running their thumbs on their smartphones and everything. I think we need to get more kids out there in the ring and boxing and learning the lessons that boxing taught us. Yeah, they took, uh, they took Gleason's to Brooklyn. I guess, you know, it was a business decision. But I, you know, one day I went uh, to 30th Street where it used to be and I went in there and inside the sign is still up on the on the balcony, Gleason's. And I started having a flashback of a lot of things that happened back then. I, I got emotional, man, going in there. I remember the first time I went in, I got emotional, thinking about that history and all the people, like you talked about some of the people you were working out side by side. Uh, who some of the people you worked out side by side with? Yeah, no, so I mean, I remember when we were going there, you know, there was uh, Saul Mamby, Mike McCollum. I got a chance to spar with Hector Camacho. I remember one time there was a big hype. In comes Aaron Pryor and he's doing sit-ups and yeah, Jerry Cooney would I, come in and he'd kiss his there. trainer. And then I remember one time I was sparring with a guy named Coco Sanchez. And, I spar with him. And he broke my nose. So, wow. <laughs> and I remember in the middle of it, right, I was uh, 14, 15 years old. I think he was training to fight a guy named, maybe it was Robin Blake. It was a tall guy and I was yeah. tall and skinny. And yeah. I don't know if he realized I was 15 years old. So he, he ends up breaking my nose, blood starts coming out. And I remember Bobby, our trainer came in there. He's like, yo, yo, what you doing, Coco? You know, and he, he was sort of, 
he was a little upset that he broke my nose, but yeah. it, it sort of taught me something, you know, and you got to always have your guard up. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I got to tell you, those memories and being able to speak to someone who knows what it's like to walk in there, the smell, the, the, the sort of the energy that you got when you walked in there and you hear the rhythm of the, the speed bag and you pop, yeah. pop, 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 pop. It just, yeah. it, you know, speaking to you today just brought back those memories. And I yeah. remember that you were so good with me, even though, you know, I was this little 14, 15 year old kid. You talked to me with respect. You were very, when we were sparring, you, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't beat the crap out of me. Every once in a while, you'd hit me in the solar plexus and I'd lose my breath. But that was your way of saying, hey, keep your hands, you know, protect yourself. Right. And, right. Uh, <laughs> so I, 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 I can understand standing there and seeing that and feeling that nostalgia. Yes. I'm I feeling it right a... now talking to you. Yeah, I, I used to spar with Pacoa Sanchez a lot, a lot. He boxed a lot. He was a 10-round fighter, and I, I was still an amateur sparring with this professional guy. And I used to do very well with him. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember watching you. I, I was yeah. like, wow, this dude is bad. <laughs> yeah, but you left somebody out, man. I mean, you left someone out that you didn't mention. And I'm like, hey, what's going on? And that would be Roberto Duran. He trained there. <laughs> Have you ever seen him there? No, I never saw him. Okay, so he was a little bit before. But he trained there. Oh, I, you know what? I saw, He came there. I didn't see him a lot, but I saw him when he was giving the fight uh, David Moore. Uh-huh. From the Bronx. Yeah, and he came in Gleason's gym. He started, he was kind of shaking out, you know, not sparring, but just loosening up. And he took off his shirt. Everybody was, like, clapping in the gym. He was in shape. For that fight. <laughs> he was in tip top condition. Yeah, Roberto Duran. He, he, yeah, that's a lot of history right there. I know, I know. It brings back memories. Now, what about Ira Becker? Well, what about what? Ira Becker. Oh, Ira, the guy at the front desk. Yeah. Yeah, no, I remember Ira. He was always, you know, talking me up and trying to, you know, trying to say this is our young prospect. Of course, I, I, was, I wasn't a Ricky Young, but he would always talk me up and say, this is one of our finest young prospects. Yeah, he was the guy that signed me up. I forget how much it cost a month, but I remember one time we were talking and we were like, yeah, man, this boxing stuff's expensive when you need, you know, your, your headgear and the, and, yeah. and, and the protector and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a very interesting and fun time. You know, like you said, Jerry Cooney's, being there all the time. And, and Teddy, Atlas. Huh? Teddy Atlas, too. Oh, yeah. Teddy Atlas was in there every day. And uh, I used to spar with uh, Sal Manby a lot. A lot. That was a he very He had a great jab. Game. Yeah, you know he passed on, right? He Oh, he passed on? Yeah, I think I heard that. Yeah, a couple of years ago, he made his transition. But, uh, yeah, he was awesome, man. And we went to camp together and everything. Man, I learned a lot from him. Yeah, he was a very, very... You know, his story was, you know, he had a so-so record. Uh-huh. But all of a sudden, like, he just got serious about it. And you know, he started he, he winning. Was, he was champ, right? He yeah, had the had like, WBC had like, or WBA. Right. But, but at, at one point, even during that time, he had, like, about 14 losses. Because he, I don't think he took it serious. And then when he got serious about it, started training, he went all the way to Indonesia and brought him back to championship. I think he stopped the guy in the 14th round. And then they were going 15, 15 rounds back then. So, you know, he got serious about it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like you are getting serious with this mayorship. <laughs> I mean, that's an amazing, you know, journey, man. Like, to, you know, even to have the courage to step up to that. I got to tell you, it's, um, it's been an experience because it's very different than what I do every day from right. the practical aspect, being a surgeon and operating, but it's actually the same extension because as a doctor, as a surgeon, you're taking care of people and you're taking right. care of all people. You don't judge right. them. When someone walks into my office, I don't know whether they're Republican or Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can see what shade of skin color they are. I can hear their accent. I can see and hear the differences but when they're prepped and draped on that operating room table and I'm in their chest, they're all the same. Like we spoke about earlier, they all bleed the same red blood. And so you just have to put whatever, 
preconceived ideas you have and even political differences aside and make sure you take care of them. And, and I got to tell you, I, I've seen the best in people when they have been at their worst. So when they come to see me, it's usually because they have a cancer and you see how they deal with it. And mm. I got to tell you, both ends of the spectrum, you know, people who are uh, Trump supporters I've taken care of, who have, uh, I've been pleasantly surprised with how good people they can be and people who have been on the socialist spectrum as well, who have, uh, I I've seen the best in, in, in everybody. And our initial reaction is to say, this person's so different from me, uh, I can't relate to this person. And you automatically put up a wall in between you. And I think politics needs the same thing nowadays. So for me, being a doctor and going into politics, my reason for going into politics is to help people. And that's why I became a doctor. So to me, it's an extension. And when I see what I've been seeing nowadays with the people getting affected with their home environment, that makes me realize, you know what? They need something else. I can't keep taking my knife and operating on them after they're sick. I got to try and prevent this somehow. So I know it's a long shot. I know I'm a big underdog. But if I can get a platform where I can make people take notice of this and realize, listen, there's half a million of our brothers and sisters in New York City that need real change, right? Most of the time you, you hire a politician or you vote for a politician, nothing really changes, whether you're Republican, Democrat, this or that. This thing is something we can really make a difference about for people who really need it. And if you can make sure that they have opportunities similar to the opportunities that I had. Now, I think a lot of my opportunities were luck and chance and stuff, but thank God uh, I had them. And I'd like to make, make it so the people, poor people living in this city have those opportunities by design, that it's not just luck. So to me, it's a natural extension of being a doctor and taking care of people just on a bigger scale. Are you gonna be involved in the debates? I'm going to try if I can get enough exposure uh, out there with the media, uh, with, uh, you know, somehow if I can figure out this politics game of how to get a platform, then hopefully I can be. And that's my point. I want to really be able to be on that debate stage and have a platform where I can be a voice for those that don't really have a voice for themselves. Right. Wow. That's interesting. Uh, so... The guy from the Guardian Angels is running. So he won as a Republican. He won. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. And then it's Eric Adams. And then Eric Adams from the Democrat side. Right. And, you know, they're both um, have that political party behind them. And I think that's what has been the biggest problem with fixing problems in New York City, like NYCHA, which is my the primary thing that I'm concerned about because you've had Republicans for many decades where NYCHA went downhill, and we just had about a decade of Democratic uh, leadership where it's continued to go downhill. Because I was always taught when I was raised, I remember I asked my mom one day, I said, hey, Ma, I remember it was Jimmy Carter against Gerald Ford. And I said, Ma, are we Republicans or Democrats? She said, <laughs> sweetie, we're poor, we're Democrats. So my, wow. in, in my head, I always thought, okay, Democrats take care of poor people. But what I've realized is nowadays Democrats, it, it, there's a hypocrisy in it in that they're supposed to be for the poor, but they're more associated with big money and special interests than, than the Republicans, at least in New York City. So, wow. so even though you may think someone is a good person, whether it's Eric Adams or, or Curtis Sliwa, there's a whole partisan machine that is working to have them do what's in the machine's best interest. The, the, the Democratic machine needs to keep going. The Republican machine needs to keep going. And each <laughs> candidate in there are basically pawns to make sure that the machine uh, sort of keeps itself going. They're kind of like corporations, the Democratic and the Republican corporation. That's the way I look at it. And the wow. only way you're going to really make a difference is if you can 
get people to vote differently, to say, I had enough of this political crap. I want someone that's actually going to make a difference. You got to make sure that what you're fighting for is actually achievable and that it's powerful. And so in my mind, I do see the NYCHA thing as something I can figure that out. I've been able to figure out something that God created, uh, the human body with surgery. I sure as hell should be able to figure out something that man created. That, that's this is going to be uh is in november right so it's november 2nd when's the election we have about three and a half months to try and get some exposure uh where i can try and get my message out there but it's tough i mean nobody knows who i am you know I, i'm lucky you you took me on your show you know yeah yeah and i appreciate it yeah and you you, you came on the show and you also got to vote. <laughs> so, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it and let people know what you're doing. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's important, man. You know, my own boxing buddy. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, surgery, politics, boxing. That's a hell of a combination, man. <laughs> that is a hell of a com uh, combination. So I hope you I hope you get involved. In, now, do you have to get a certain amount of signatures to get into the debates? So we're already on the ballot for the uh, election. For the debates, I don't know if it is polling or if it's uh, money or something. I, I don't know yet. But to get on the ballot for the general election you had to get a certain amount of signatures. We needed uh, 3,750. We ended up getting 6,000 signatures. And so that was the initial hurdle to get over because there are some people that tried to get on the ballot who didn't make it. And so uh, because it's geared towards insiders, you never hear about a Democrat or a Republican not making the ballot because they're part of the machine. Okay. And so, you know, if you want real... Uh, improvements and differences to be made, I think you got to vote differently. Just voting Democrat and Republican, when they've been the cause of a lot of the issues, especially with public housing, you're going to get more of the same. No matter what they're talking, it, it, they're going to do the bidding of whatever the machine wants. And they may be saying one thing here, but they're dealing with special interests behind closed doors. You know, you got to follow the money and you'll find out where the corrupt is. Raja, are you still there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, because I don't see you. So where I grew up in the project, I actually grew up in the projects, right? In NYCHA, right? So I'm walking down the street one day and there's a small street in between, on one side is NYCHA, on the other side is co-op. And so I seen the guy cleaning up over on the co-op side. So I said, hey, how you doing? Spoke to him and then I said, uh, do you have any rats over there? He says, no. He says, no. And <laughs> uh, the other side has rats, many rats. What do you think about that? I mean, we're talking about a small street, a small, one street, it's not even that far away. And they're on one side, not on the other side. What do you think about that, uh, Roger? I mean, that, that's typical. That We see that very, very frequently in this city where the whole characteristics of a neighborhood changes just by crossing the street, just by one block. And, you know, as a doctor who's worked uh, in the emergency rooms in, in the Bronx and in Washington Heights and stuff, I've seen patients uh, who've gotten bitten by rats, you know, and it doesn't surprise me that the people. Are you there, Roger? I'm there. I just saw something go across the screen, though, I think like an announcement. So, uh, so it doesn't surprise me that the poorer people have the rats there and the people who can afford 
or who get catered to because they have uh, more money get treated differently, even though both groups of people are paying rent, which is a percentage of how much they make. So one group is being neglected and the other group is not. And, and to me, that's not what this country is built on. That's not, uh, that's not part of our values. Our values are, you, you know, you, you work hard, you pay your dues, and you should get treated fairly. And that's not what I see happening in this city right now. And from the medical viewpoint, I see it every day. I, I got a, a front seat row to the, uh, uh, the challenges uh, that affect the people of this city. I've taken care of, in one room, I got a billionaire, and in another room, I got a homeless person, and I treat both of them equally. Uh, yeah, the billionaire gets the special room with the fancy food and, and the TV and everything, <laughs> but the homeless people is going to get that same care that I'm giving that billionaire. Wow, that's deep. That's very deep. Uh, what do you think of this? This broadcast is broadcast. The studio is located on a housing project. Beautiful studio. I'm going to send you some pictures and then we got to get you in the studio. But I mean, the fact that there's a studio and the projects, a beautiful studio that's doing this work. What do you think about that? I love it. And it just goes to show you the power of the people. If the people could really come together and realize that there's power in numbers, the reason why NYCHA gets neglected is because the politicians sort of know that many people in NYCHA don't vote. There's a lot of power in NYCHA, half a million people. If they voted as a block, politicians would be bending over backwards to try and satisfy them. And that's the problem. We've got to be able to inspire people to realize your destiny is in your own hands. And a simple thing by registering early to vote and voting for someone that you feel has your best interest at heart that's how you're going to make these things change. And that's how you're going to make a better world for your kids. Mm, okay. All right. Uh, that's pretty deep. You know, I think it's important that, for example, like you, at a young age, decided like, hey, you know what? Education is important. And, you know, the fact that you know, you, you educated yourself, you know, with the flashcards. And I see behind you is like <laughs> many, many books, <laughs> many books. Yeah. Yeah, no, so I think, I think education is the key. Um, that is the key to get you out of pro poverty. That is the key for freedom, uh, is to educate yourself. And, you know, for some people though, school is difficult and I get that. And that's why you need other kinds of education. Uh, I remember growing up, we had kids that went to automotive or to aviation and, and that, that's very right. important. Those vocational schools, when you got a job like that, you got self-confidence, You something in you is different. And mm -hmm. the biggest thing to avoid the violence that we see going on nowadays is a job. That will take care of a lot of that stuff. Male role models and a job, and we will help our society better than anything else. Mm -hmm. When I was uh, in high school, they had a program called the co-op program. And you worked a week, and you went to school a week. And one of the jobs that I had was in Bellevue Hospital. <laughs> and I was a transporter. That was a very interesting job. And I thought I thought it had it was you know it was valuable because you're helping people you're going to pick people up when they come into the hospital take them to their room so you want to kind of make them feel I mean they're coming to take care of something that's serious so you want to kind of be you know kind to them when they're going to their appointments they're in the hospital already they're going to their appointments throughout the hospital you're taking them and you know some people you have to take down to the morgue and you know gathering their things that was a very interesting job. And I liked it too. Yeah, no, I, th I see it now in my hospital where, you know, I always engage the people that are transporting my patients and mm. you got to see how they know that the patient there is scared, uh, is vulnerable. Right. And I hear them talking to them and joking with them and just trying to make them feel comfortable. 
it, right. it really makes you have hope in humanity. And it, it's something True. that, uh, and they have this pride about them. They know they're part of the big mission of the hospital. Without that person transporting that patient, it, the whole machine stops. The person that cleans the room after the patient leaves, the secretary who's on the phone, who makes sure that, that they, they don't feel like they're bothering them. Uh, that makes them feel comfortable because they're the ones that are sick, not the person on the other end of that phone. And so there's so many different parts. And, and in my hospital, it's one of the biggest uh, providers of jobs to East Harlem. So they, a lot of the people who work with me uh, are from the local area. A lot live uh, right across the street in Carver. And so, you know, you wow. see how important a job is, uh, not only for an individual, but for society as a whole. Wow, that's 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 interesting. There's a lot of projects in that area over there by Mount Sinai. Yep, a lot. Yeah. And you know, during COVID, those were the people that kept coming to work. And I, I think, you know, and 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 that's one of the biggest things that pushed me at the beginning of this year, you know, we were all surviving uh getting beat up by the whole COVID era. I mean, I didn't miss a day of work. I was exhausted by up to now. And uh, what I realized, the people who were fighting for COVID, the nurses, the transporters, the technicians, almost more than half of them at, at our hospital live in NYCHA. Yet they got to go home to a crumbling wall, to mold, to this or that. And we just got to do better. We just got to do better. Okay. Well, you know what? We got to get you some votes, man. Get you in that, in you know, city hall. And hey, make it make it happen, man. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, but you're biased because you know I got fast hands. So you you there know you you're biased. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right. Uh, any any memories you have of Bobby that he shared with you and taught you? Well, I remember that Bobby was somebody that really inspired me because you could tell when he was teaching you, he would just do something simple, like just do this. And he was fast, you know, yeah. and Bobby w w was, was a little older. And, yeah. and I just remember him sort of always giving me the advice. You throw two punch, you throw four punch, you throw four punch, you throw eight punch, you throw eight yeah. punch, you throw 16 punch, you get all over that sucker. And yeah. I just remember feeling that energy. And then when you look at him teaching you this skill, and then you look at his own story, a guy who actually fought, uh, and, and I, I think he beat Sandy Sadler, right. uh, world champion, yeah. and who he beat, ended he beat up, three world champions. And, and to see this guy who's so humble, and then you look at his own story and you realize he actually killed a man in the ring. Right. And then he stopped boxing. And to have- Literally. Yeah and, and, yeah, and to have the privilege of having this guy not only teach you how to fight, but through his example, you learned how to be a man. I mean, you got to realize I met Bobby when I was 14 and at a time when I was looking for male role models and he just taught me that you could be tough, confident, strong at that age, you know, knowing how to fight was a big deal. You know, you, you wanted yeah. to know, yeah, you could handle yourself. And, but it was his way of being a man that left the biggest impression on me. Here's a guy who is just very caring, very humble, soft-spoken, and you know he went through his crap in his life. And mm -hmm. so I, I think he both taught us <laughs> something that we've kept in here as we've gotten older and, um, and both of us, you and I, are, are trying to reach out to our communities and trying to make it better. And I don't know, maybe that came from him. Uh, who yeah. knows where he came from? Right. Yeah, I learned a lot from him, man. We had a lot of great conversations. And, like, you know, what stands out for me, like you said, the kindness. You know, he had soft-spoken kindness. And he, he wasn't a boastful guy. He didn't brag about no who he was, what he did. I mean, you know, he would tell us a story. You know, of course he had to tell us, but he was he was a kind, like you said, he was kind. Yeah. Yeah, so he, you know, in, in, in my book, he's a legend. My, my book, book too. My book yeah. too. 
Yeah, he worked with musicians. You know, he trained Miles Davis. I didn't know that. <laughs> he trained, it's in the book. Miles Davis, Miles Davis wrote it in his book. He came there one day. He came to Gleason's one day. I mean, I didn't know who he was. I was in the ring shadow boxing and this guy was looking at me so hard. Like, <laughs> like he was looking through me almost. So I'm standing. So you tuned in to VHBR.NYC, Grant House's Community Radio, home of the Community News Service and the soul, the soul, the soul. of the Upper West Side. That was Tina Dixon again doing the station ID. So are you there, Roger? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So Bobby went to get me to take me out the rain to go in the back where the heavy bags were. So I go back there, I start working on the heavy bag, and then this guy walks back there and he's smoking. And I got an attitude. I told him, <laughs> I said, no, you can't smoke back here, man. You got to go in the front. You can't. Now you can't even smoke in the gym now. But like I said, you got to go in the front. I had an attitude like I'm like they're working out. He's gonna come back to smoking, and he just went and walked up to the front, and that was Miles Davis. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> Find out later who he was. So, yeah, no, I wouldn't know at that age at 14. I, I wouldn't have yeah. known who Miles Davis was. And the other yeah. thing that I remember about in the back was that you know you had this little shower. There was a pipe sticking out. And that the water was always freezing cold. And then it was never any hot water. And I remember I was coming out one day and I can't remember who was out there. Maybe, maybe it was Mike Dominguez or, or I remember him saying, no, you get that cold water. It makes you tough. And so wow. I was like, okay, I'm taking a cold shower. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. A lot of, lot of, uh, there was a guy by the name of Willie Felix and, so my birthday had came up and he, and I said, oh yeah, Willie, it's my birthday. He said, taught, well, I learned from him that on your birthday, a great thing to do is honor your mom. Take your mom out to dinner. And I started doing that mother, and my mother, she loved it after that. And I started, you know, giving her gifts on my birthday. That's a great, that's a great thing that I learned from Willie Felix. Yeah, there's all these little pearls that if you listen, they're out there. And, you know, mm -hmm. having grown up with my mom, I, I take care of my mom. My mom lives right next door and, you know, she I'm the only one she has. So uh, I still take care of my mom to this day. Right. Awesome. Yeah, I learned that from Willie Felix. That was a great, uh, great lesson that he shared with me. And I, I, I appreciated that because my mom got happy when my birthday came. Like, hey, where we going? What we going to do? Where we going? I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. You know, and I, I, I got to say, I, I also learned from you, the way you carried yourself, the way you spoke to everybody with dignity, and the fact that you didn't have to give me any time a day, 14, 15-year-old little kid, and here you are, you would talk to me with respect, and I saw the way you were, and that taught me something, that you could be this dude who had some bad hands, who could really, you know, put a hurting on somebody, <laughs> Yet you could take the time uh, to give me the time of day. And as a yeah. 14, 15 year old kid, I, I never forgot that. Wow. Yeah, that's that's important, man. You know, that's important. Very important. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. So any any final words that you want to share with the people as you get ready to go on this step into the, the mayor's ring? The boxing yeah, no. ring for the mayor? <laughs> you know, it, it, I've never done anything like this in my life, but, mm -hmm. you know, I've spent my whole life taking care of people. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I just want to take care of people who right now are having a hard time getting their message out. So I want to try and get the message out that I think it's our duty to make sure that that we take care of them, that they don't have to live with fungus coming uh, coming through their bathrooms where I got to cut out half of their lung. I just, uh, there's something very disturbing in that, that I, I can't sit back anymore and let that happen without saying something. And no one's going to listen unless you have a big platform. So that's why I figure I got to do this mayor thing. If I can get that platform, maybe I can make a difference. Like I was saying before, my my buddy said, yo, Raj, why are you going into politics? And if you're going to do it, you might as well go to city council first. It's 
you know, that's like a stepping stone. And I said, you know what, if, if you win city council, you may have one or two houses. You're not going to make a difference. You got to change the heart of the system. You know, there's NYCHA throughout the five boroughs and, and all those people that live in there are suffering from the same thing. Uh, and so that's why I think I had to go with doing this mayor run to try and get that platform that can actually make a difference. So I, I appreciate you taking the time to hear me out. And, uh, and I hope that, you know, maybe we can do some good with this run to benefit our city in general, win or lose. Yeah, I would like for you to come back. I'd love to, I'd love to. I'd love for you to come back. And let me just say this, this is what I, something I know for sure that Bobby McQuilla would be so, pr not only proud of you, he would be super proud of you and what you're doing and what you've done with your life. And he would be proud of you too. You know, yeah. I mean, I just, it's, it's funny to me because you were an amateur when I was, when I was going there. Right. And, you know, he got to see you sort of develop and become a pro and, you know, Bobby, I did my thing and then I left and that was right. it. So uh, I think he would be even prouder of you because he saw you, you know, sort of go down his path. And I think that, um, you know, the way we are today trying to help our community, I, I do think Bobby had a big hand in, in being the role model that helped us choose a, 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 a better path. Uh, mm -hmm than we could have chosen. I'm not saying I haven't made my mistakes. I've made mistakes. Me too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Listen, I want to thank you, man, for coming on. Roger Flores, and I wish you all the best. Thanks, Ricky. I appreciate it. All right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. All right. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. This is uh, Rick Young signing off with another segment of What's in Your Hand here at WH. CR and GHCR, the voice of Harlem and the sound of Harlem. All right, talk to you soon. All right. All right. All right. And David is a king, and God says, what's in your hand? He said, I've got a harp in my hand. He said, well, David, play on your harp. And he played, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Take me to lie down in green pastures. Leave me beside still waters. Yea, though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, I've been only What's in your hand? What's in your hand? Man hanging on a cross. I've got two nails in my hand. Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdrawest thyself from me, whither shall I go? And that man with two nails in his hand split history in half, B.C. and A.D., and what's in your hand tonight, people of Cambridge? You've got God in your hand, and he'll let you win because he's on your side and one with God, always in the majority. So walk with him and talk with him and work with him and stick together and fight together. And with God's hand in your hand, the victory will be accomplished here sooner than you dreamed, sooner than you hoped, sooner than you prayed.